So now let's turn to, uh, to other question, uh, still concerning, of course, implementation and enforcement of IHL, but uh, so I'm turning to, to you, uh, Professor Eric David, uh, because you're a professor in uh, international humanitarian law, but you're also a former member of the International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission. And so why we know, the students know that this commission has never been used uh, in practice, so why and what should be changed for uh, in order to, to make that commission more attractive for, for states? What's your, what's your view? Difficult question, of course. Yeah. But uh, I'm pleased to try to, to answer the, the, the question. In fact, uh, I would like firstly to uh, recall some characteristics, some features of the uh, International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission. And then I shall address uh, some the reasons which could explain why this commission remains today, uh, I should, would say, uh, 26 years after its, its birth, it remains a ghost commission. And you have a ghost before you. <laughs> I'm a ghost. Well, uh, firstly, concerning the features of this commission, it's a permanent organ established by treaty, the first additional protocol uh, to the Geneva Conventions. It's Article 90 of the first additional protocol. And so it does, this commission is founded by agreement between states. The competence of the IHFFC, I'm going to use the acronym IHFFC, depends on an express recognition from states through an optional clause system, which is similar to uh, the ICGA system. And today, uh, the, the competence of the IH, IHFFC has been accepted by 76 states today. It's, the, it's not, of course, uh, a large number of states. It's uh, more than a third of the international community. So, you, as you see, uh, many states have not yet recognized uh, the jurisdiction of the Commission. Furthermore, the IHFFC is composed of IHL experts, thus they should be IHL professionals, who are supposed to know its contents, the contents of IHL, and the condition of its application. If the IHFFC was given a mandate, the Commission would become public only if such is the wish of the parties. And the existence of this Commission has been hailed several times by the Security Council, by the United Nations General Assembly, and by various states. The mandate of the IHFFC is confined by Article 90 to the grave IHL breaches, breaches allegedly committed in an international armed conflict. But uh, the IHFFC can also exercise its mandate in a non-international armed conflict with the agreement of the parties. These are the main features of the Commission. Now, why this Commission has not met uh, success, in spite of its merits and advantages? In fact, as I, as I said, the Commission has never been entrusted with a fact-finding mission on IHL, on I IHL violations. And it's, it's rational. And in fact, these violations have been frequent since uh, the birth of the IHFFC in 1991. 
The lack of success of the Commission is due to several factors. Firstly, the competence of the Commission is too narrow because it's limited to IHL violations and not extending, it's, it, does not, it does not extend uh, its competence, it's not extended to human rights violations. In fact, uh, during the 20 last years, a number of commissions have been established by international organizations, but it was always ad hoc commissions and never uh, organs like uh, the Human Rights Council uh, asked the IHFFC FFC to, to take care of, of a case. And uh, in fact, this, there's the second reason for the lack of success of the Commission. The Commission cannot lean on an international organization which would have some weight, some political weight, to uh, improve uh, the success of the Commission. There is also the, the Commission as a, a secretariat, it's a Swiss secretariat, which is inside the Swiss government, but this secretariat has no power of initiative. Uh, fourth reason, you mean uh, that it, the, sorry? It must, you mean that the Secretariat must wait uh, action by states, it must wait that states will, yes, absolutely. will, will say, will absolutely. ask the Commission yes, yes, to yes, yes, uh, inquire. Uh, so. the, the, the Secretariat uh, can, cannot by itself uh, bring some initiative. Or, uh, it's only maybe the, uh, the Bureau or the President of the Commission who can try to uh, Invite to appeal to the states, but it, uh, uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, the commission feels a little bit like a, a, a car sailor, <laughs> and it's difficult to 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 sail cars. So uh, maybe it's, that's also one of the reasons. But uh, another more serious reason is also the high price of a fact-finding mission. Don't forget that a, a fact-finding mission requires five members of the Commission plus two ad hoc members which would be designed, which would be appointed by the states, plus the administrative staff and uh, all the expenses of this mission, uh, five members plus two uh, ad hoc members plus uh, the staff, uh, should be supported by the belligerent parties themselves. And of course, it's also something which can uh, maybe break uh, the states to resort to the Commission. Another reason, it's the fifth reason I see, is the presence in the Commission of a majority of Western members. Uh, while most conflicts concern countries uh, in the third world, uh, which lead them, which lead these countries to mistrust a commission whose most members would come mainly from the West. The sixth, sixth reason is the fact that the proceedings are relatively heavy. It's a little bit like a kind of arbitration with uh, uh, the, the same weight of an arbitration and depending always on the agreement of the parties. Uh, as I said about what I said about the Secretariat, there is no right of the Commission to launch an inquiry ex officio. And finally, I think that one of the most important reasons why two belligerent states could not agree to mandate the Commission to make a fact-finding mission is the fact that it's a little bit unrealistic to believe that two belligerent parties which use force against each other would be prepared to accept a peaceful means 
of settlement, such, such as a fact-finding uh, mission, to settle a mere question of compliance with IHL. It's a little bit a kind of utopia, yes. Uh, I think that in order to solve the lack of success of the IHFFC, in spite of its merits, which I believe are real, uh, it has been suggested that the IHFFC takes the initiative to introduce itself as a, a kind of reserve of IHL experts to tender its services as an amicus curiae before judicial and institutional organs. That could be maybe uh, something which could be do, which could be done to rejuvenate itself and to get support from an institutional organ. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So th th thanks a lot. But you can reassure me that uh, as a former member, you were a member of the commission. Did you work in this commission? Did you have some work to, to, to do? Because we say that the commission has never been used in practice, but I guess that you had some work uh, when you were uh, sitting in the commission. Well, you know, it, 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 it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to do a, a kind of the, the work of, uh, uh, in French we say, a représentant de commerce. Uh, I, I don't have the, this kind of, uh, of envy to, 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 to act like that, to, to, to play this role. Uh, it's true that uh, we should do that. And the, the, the president of the commission did that uh, during the 10 years when I was a member of the commission. Uh, I saw the uh, president of the commission going everywhere in the world in order to try to sell the commission, but unfortunately without success. But I tell you, it's very difficult from a psychological and sociological point of view to imagine that two states which are resorting to force against each other could accept that for a, a, a small incident they would accept uh, the jurisdiction of the commission. But of course, uh, uh, you must always try to do something. And uh, I tell you uh, that the members of the bureau and the president do their best, but it's mm. difficult. It's a difficult and, and task. Will you, will you sometimes, will you about to, to achieve an agreement between states uh, about a fight fighting mission or... Uh, there was sometimes a situation in which uh, there was a beginning of, of an agreement or the commission was saved well, or in, not at all? Or in, in fact, uh, we, uh, uh, on different uh, occasions, uh, different times, uh, we have tendered our services, we have proposed to act, but uh, unfortunately we, we, we don't succeed in getting uh, a mandate. Even the... Uh, UN uh, Secretary General uh, already seized us, but uh, when we proposed the members of uh, the Commission for uh, a conflict which occurs uh, in Africa, and there was uh, not one member, well, not one African member, so. Uh, we were dismissed, <laughs> if I may say, and uh, we, we had no success. And there was another mission, an, an ad hoc mission, which was uh, organized uh, for that uh, specific conflict. Mm -hmm. So thanks a lot for this experience as a member of the, the, the commission. So.